this morning here at St. John's Lutheran Church. Uh, my name is David Kieseberg, and I'm very uh, privileged to lead this worship service this morning. And we're going through a very difficult and uh, uncertain time, and I think uh, more than ever before, it's a great comfort to be able to, uh, to come together in a moment of worship and to be comforted by God's word and, and also by the love and care of our brothers and sisters in the faith. We gather today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join now in our gathering song, Shine, Jesus, Shine.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your Spirit to know the things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always, and also with you. At this time, we call on Jen to lead us in the children's message. Hi, all you amazing children of God. I'm so glad you've joined us for worship today. Today, I'm joining you from my mother's house, just outside of La Crosse, Wisconsin. I was called over early this morning, and as I was driving, I was, I was noticing the trees and the changing colors, and I was thinking about the gospel for today, the third gospel that has to do with a vineyard. And I was wondering, why on earth are we talking about a vineyard again today? And as I was driving and looking at the colors and as I was thinking about how things change and the seasons change and our lives change, I realized, I wonder if we're talking about the vineyard again because it's a sign of how much God loves us, that God provides for us, that God takes care of us. I mean, God created everything and it was good, right? And so the vineyard is good, and the ground is good, and the food is good, and the, the grapes are good. God created all of that for us. And as I noticed the colors and the much cooler air, I thought, yeah, maybe it is time to take a moment and just remember that God loves us so much, that God created the entire world. And in the entire world, there's enough for all. And then God said that we were here to take care of the earth. What a gift to know that there's enough for everyone here on this earth and a gift to know that God loves us so much that God is still taking care of us, whether it's in a vineyard or a cornfield, whether it's through fields that are filled with vegetables that Jen doesn't like or whether it's bananas and pineapple and delicious fruit. God created everything, and it was good, and God's still creating everything, and it's good. So look around, take a moment, take a deep breath, go outside, check out the trees, feel that crisp air, and say, God, God, you've done good, and thank you. Thank you for loving us that much. Well, we might as well then pray. Good morning, God. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for creating everything we need. Thank you for loving us to make sure that there's enough for all. And help us remember to take a moment and appreciate everything you've given us. The changing colors of the trees, the changing temperature, the changing seasons. We love you, God. Amen. Thanks for joining us. I hope you have a great week. The first reading comes from Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved has a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines and built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed a, a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and I will be devoured. 
it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The second lesson is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4b through 14. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the faith, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The Holy Gospel for this day is found in the 21st chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, beginning with the 33rd verse. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the people, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, Surely they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in Scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produce the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them, and they wanted to arrest him. But they feared the crowds, because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. This morning, 
we are back in the vineyard again for the third Sunday in a row. And if you wonder why this is, it is simply because Jesus loved to tell vineyard stories. And his people had been telling vineyard stories for hundreds of years. And it should be pointed out that the three stories that we've looked at are quite different from each other, and they do not teach the same lesson. In the first story, the laborers are complaining about how their wages were distributed. They were focused on the question of fairness. Who deserved more and who deserved less? They saw justice through the eyes of the marketplace, while the vineyard owner chose to reflect the generosity of God, who pours out his abundant gifts on all who need those gifts. Then came the little story of the two sons sent by their father to work in the vineyard. The first son promised to obey his father, but then went and did his own thing, as sons and daughters too are often inclined to do. The other son defied his father at first, but then repented and eventually did his duty. Jesus asks then, which son was the more obedient? What he was really asking his disciples, and I think asking us, is what kind of a son are you? Are you a talker or a doer? As someone who has spent most of my adult life talking, I find that a rather uncomfortable question but not nearly as uncomfortable as today's parable, the parable of the wicked, selfish, violent tenants of the vineyard. As we learned from our first lesson, in telling this parable, Jesus was reaching back more than 700 years to the prophet Isaiah, who gave voice to some of the most poignant words in all of the Bible. It has been called the love song of the vineyard, and it expresses the deep love and care that Yahweh had for his people Israel. But as we soon discover, it also reflects the terrible heartbreak of a loving parent who has done everything possible to enable a beloved son or daughter to be blessed and to be fruitful, only to see that love rejected and that rebellious child headed down the path to destruction. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning the vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it, cleaned it of stones, and planted it with choice vines. He wanted it to be a lifelong enduring relationship, so he built a wall around it and set a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat. Then he waited, expecting it to yield fine grapes, but all it yielded was bitter grapes. Many centuries later, challenged by his enemies, now near the end of his ministry on earth, Jesus recalled that love song of the vineyard, and he uses it to invite his disciples and to invite us to consider the challenges that we face as we seek to live out his vision for the vineyard. This is a kind of heartbreaking text, a kind of text that makes a preacher wish he had chosen another occupation. It's a dark story of human greed and envy and anger leading to escalating violence. Even the son of the vineyard owner is not spared in Jesus' story. At the end of the story, Jesus asks his listeners, what do you think the owner of the vineyard will do to those wicked tenants? Someone in his audience answers his question. Oh, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to tenants who will treat the vineyard the way it should be treated. I find it interesting that Jesus doesn't agree or disagree with that answer but rather takes the discussion in a completely different direction. He quotes scripture. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. It is as though Jesus is saying, 
you're missing the real point of this story. The greed and violence of the wicked tenants is not the real story. That's an old, familiar story, a story that's been repeated over and over again. In fact, it's a story that's alive and well, even to this very day. Jesus quotes this passage of Scripture, the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The disciples would realize later that when Jesus spoke about the vineyard's owner being sent to confront the greed and violence of the tenant, Jesus was speaking about himself, about his own impending death, the death at the hands of temple and empire. His story that day would not be heard just by Jesus' disciples, but standing with them, I'm sure, were the chief priests and Pharisees who understood only too well that Jesus was speaking about them. A few days later, they would conspire to nail him to a cross. Those same temple authorities would mock him as he hangs on the cross. But his response to all that hatred and violence was to pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In a world of hatred and violence, Jesus' response was to love even his enemies with the last ounce of his breath. This suggests to us a different vision of the vineyard and a different vision of the world seen through Jesus' eyes, seen as a place where a loving community can be created and where God's children can truly flourish. The vineyard into which we are being invited is a place of fruitfulness, a place where God helps us to bear abundant fruit. The vineyard is a place where we are being invited into a close and loving relationship with Jesus and with his loving Father. Jesus invites us through this picture to live in him, to live as a partner in his life for the sake of the world. I think it's important for us to understand that we cannot live in this vineyard and remain unchanged. Jesus talks in another passage about God's work of pruning the branches of our life so that we can become more fruitful. That sounds to me like something that may involve a fair amount of necessary pain. And I find myself asking, what are the patterns and practices in my life that need to be pruned? Because they keep me from being as fruitful as I could be. There are several thoughts that come to mind and they all make me uncomfortable. I think, for example, about the ease with which I let myself slide into a comfortable, familiar, and largely self-centered way of living. I would be in deep trouble if I didn't have Sonia prodding me to get up from my couch and be more involved in what is happening in our community and in our world. There is some pruning that also needs to happen in my own mind and heart. This past week, Sonia and I watched the debacle of the presidential debate, and we both found it extremely disheartening. What we witnessed was something so contrary to what our wounded, divided nation needs right now. But what cries out for pruning is my own mind and heart. It is my own ugly, judgmental attitude toward those who are on the other side of the political divide. This is what perhaps needs to be pruned from my mind and heart. But to get back to our gospel lesson, the question I keep asking myself is, what was it about this rich metaphor of the vineyard that causes Jesus to come back to it over and over again? Vineyards are probably no big deal for us, as we live in this comfortable part of the world. But for the people among whom Jesus lived, to stand 
in a sun-drenched vineyard in the fall of the year, and to see grapes hanging in fragrant clusters was for them the ultimate picture of being blessed and cared for by God. The wine from those grapes would bring joy to every Sabbath celebration and all the great festivals, and in fact, every community and family event, from the joy of new birth to the community's grieving the death of a loved one, would be celebrated with the gifts of the vineyard. So the vineyard became a metaphor for any moment or place where God was lovingly present to bless his people and to guide them into a life of fruitfulness. Israel was a vineyard where God had invested his loving care. Your heart and life is a vineyard. Whether we are aware of it or not, the gospel writers tell us God is present in our lives, seeking to share his gifts and love with us and to make our lives more fulfilling and fruitful. Jesus said, I am come that you may have life and have it in all its fullness. The community of Oregon is a vineyard. God is present here in this community and at work to make this a more loving and accepting and nurturing place where all families can flourish and individuals of every creed and color and station in life can feel welcomed and respected. Of course, God is not the only one at work in this community. There will be times when the voice of the vineyard owner will be drowned out by the voices of greed and hostility and perhaps even violence. St. John's Lutheran is a vineyard. Here in this place, you gather every week as a family of faith to tell and to act out the story of the vineyard. When we break bread and share the cup of wine, we are inviting all our brothers and sisters to share in this love experienced in the vineyard. When we do that, we are challenging the popular individualized culture that keeps asking, what have you done for me lately? Instead, we raise a more fruitful question. What can we do together to share and to nourish the gifts of the vineyard, particularly with those for whom those gifts have not been very evident? We are all blessed with examples of that kind of stubborn, selfless love. And those people who have blessed us in that way, I think are almost always marked by a spirit of humility gratitude and joy. They are living proof of the words Jesus spoke, I am come that you may have life and have it in all its fullness. The metaphor of the vineyard reminds us that we not only need Jesus, we also need each other. We find our true existence, the life in which we can truly flourish when we are in that nurturing network of our brothers and sisters in the human family. As we said two weeks ago, God is relational, and so are we. I'm immensely grateful for the fact that in every vineyard in which I have lived and worked, there have always been amazing brothers and sisters in the faith who offered me far more than simple human friendship who are also committed to journey with me on our spiritual path. They have been there to laugh with me when I was in danger of taking myself too seriously and to grieve with me in times of pain and loss. To paraphrase the Beatles, I get a lot of help from my friends. There are many stories I could tell that would illustrate the gifts of the vineyard in my life but I will end with one that has always been a treasured memory for me. More than 30 years ago at Thanksgiving, our family made a trip to the Berg Farm outside Kenyon, Minnesota, 
It was a wonderful weekend for our whole family, and the gathering included some of our dear friends from my first parish in Colton, South Dakota. We told stories, we ate lots of food, we sang dozens of familiar songs, and we even danced a little to the tinny music from an old Victrola that we hauled down from the dusty attic. It was a wonderful, unforgettable weekend for all of us. But on our drive back home to Luther Valley, my wife Beverly was suddenly stricken with some deadly medical incident that took her life, took her from us in a matter of minutes. And no explanation was ever found for this heartbreaking loss to our family. But when we arrived at Luther Valley several hours later, the parking lot in front of the parsonage was filled with people who had come to grieve with us and to surround us with their comforting love. And we knew in that moment that we had come back to God's vineyard and that in that vineyard, we would journey together through this painful time. And in that group gathered there that day was a remarkable woman who a few years later would come in to share that aching void in my life and would become the primary reason I have survived all these years and flourished in God's vineyard. I could not imagine what my life would be like without her. In 2009, Advent's beloved pastor, Andrew Ragnus, wrote in his Christmas letter, thank God for the vineyard and thank God for the vine in which we are all connected and in which we find a place to truly abide. There's that wonderful word, abide. This is no passing fancy on God's part or a white one night stand. This is a relationship for which God is committed for the long haul. To be in Jesus is to be caught up in a love affair that has no end in sight. In this crazy, constantly changing world, we are offered a place to abide, a place in which we can truly thrive together. Amen. We join now in our song of the day, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light.
in response to the gospel, let us join in confessing together our holy Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With confidence in God's mercy and grace, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Holy God, you call us to work for peace and justice in your vineyard. Refresh the church with your life that we may bear fruit through work and service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for the abundant harvest of the earth. Bless and care for those whose hands bring the fruits of the earth to the tables of all who hunger. May we be inspired by your servants who care deeply for your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Curb the impulses of greed and pride that lead us to take advantage of others. Grant that world leaders seek the fruits of the kingdom for the good and welfare of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain all who suffer with the promise of new life. Assured of your presence, heal our pain and suffering, and equip us to embrace all bodies aching for wholeness of mind, body, and soul. We call to mind this morning those who are struggling with burdens of sorrow. We remember the family of Jeff Rosenau, the family of Terry Schrader, the family of Ruth Borid. We also remember Dwayne Lindstroth, Gail Meister, Meister, and Scott Bowery's uncle. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all managers in our community, for all who seek employment. Give hope and future to those who lack meaningful work, those who have been marginalized or abused in the workplace, and those who desire new opportunities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for the saints who teach us to live faithfully in your vineyard. May our chorus join theirs until our labor is complete. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold us in your loving arms, all for whom we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
We join now in our offering, and we encourage those of you to make use of the various channels through which you can direct your gifts of love uh, to this church and to its ministry. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with this rich food and drink. And send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world. Through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of this cup, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this to remember me. We pray as our Jesus taught us, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Come to the banquet table, where Christ gives himself as food and drink. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with food beyond compare, the body and blood of Christ. Lead us from this place, nourished and forgiven, into your beloved vineyard, to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst, guided by the example of the same Jesus Christ and led by the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We join now in our sending song. Hallelujah, we sing your praises. <laughs> the Lord. Thanks be to God. Here is the building improvement team.
Here is the building <laughs> improvement team horizontally. Ta-da, thank you, thank you. You also notice the uh, new sound booth has been framed in back there, a lot more room. And then, I wanna, I'm turning it back. They're gonna laugh at this video. The middle part here, we can see they've started to frame in the new windows. This is the one they haven't started yet, so for contrast, making good progress. Okay, you will see here, we've made a lot of progress in the chancel area. We've done a lot more to the flooring, starting to fill it in. We also have the main structure in the middle that's coming together nicely. They've started framing that in here as well. Doing excellent work. 